we thank you for responding to our invitation to come and join us in celebrating the life, the struggle, the sacrifice of India's most illustrious daughter and the daughter of a great father who was the front-ranking leader of India's freedom struggle. We are grateful to Rashtrapati Ji, Shri Pranam Mukherjee, for being here to deliver the Indira Gandhi Centennial Lecture. He is a scholar, president of this country, a great parliamentarian, a great orator, born into the family of freedom fighters. His erudition, his knowledge, his contribution, particularly in taking major initiatives between 2004 and 2012 on the right to information, the Food Security Act, among many others, will always be remembered. But Rashtrapati ji had worked closely with Indira ji, knew her attributes, her concern for the poor, her compassion, her courage, and also the trials and tribulations during a difficult period of India's history. Therefore, it is not only most appropriate, but we are grateful to Rashtrapati ji to come and accept the invitation of the Honorable Congress President to deliver the centennial lecture. Friends, Indira ji's notable contribution in India's nation building and her ultimate sacrifice for the unity and integrity of India shall always be remembered with respect by a grateful nation. It is important as we start the commemoration of year of Indraji's centenary that we recall, and that too with pride and gratitude, what she did, what she stood for, the values which remain not only relevant but are important to ensure that India remains as per the idea, the vision of the founding fathers, the father of the nation, Pandit Nehru, the fe his fe their fellow freedom fighters, other stalwarts of India's freedom movement. I have now the privilege to request the Honorable Congress President Shrimati Sonia Gandhi ji to deliver the welcome address. It is a privilege for me to welcome President Pranab Mukherjee on this very important occasion, a day that marks the beginning of the Indira Gandhi birth centenary year. Few Indian statesmen now alive could claim to have worked as closely with Indira ji or for as long as our distinguished Rashtrapati ji. It is most gracious of you, Rashtrapati ji, to share your memories of this remarkable leader and her legacy to all Indians. Indira Gandhi was not a figure of history for me. She was my mother-in-law. We lived under the same roof, shared joys and sorrows. And it is from her that I learned about India, about its culture, about its values. It is from her also that I imbibed my earliest political lessons. She was the Prime Minister of India, but to me, she was a mother, a mentor, a friend. It was in my arms that she drew her last breath. Indira Gandhi was a remarkable woman, the like of whom this country has not seen since. But she was much more than that. 
She was an institution, a leader with the courage of her convictions and nerves of steel, unflinching in the face of duty, resolute against all that was unjust. She led our nation through the tumultuous battles of the 60s, of the 70s, never faltering in her dedication to the masses who gave her their complete trust. She faced economic crisis and prevailed. She managed the greatest refugee crisis in human history. She refused to compromise on India's noble humanitarian traditions. She faced war with courage and determination, and her victory saw the triumph of democracy and the liberation of the nation, Bangladesh. And when powers abroad attempted to dictate terms to India, she stood up for what she thought was right, and she was vindicated by history. Indira Priyadarshini Gandhi was one of those rare figures who shaped the destiny of her land. She was not just the daughter of one of the great statesmen of our age, Jawaharlal Nehru, but a child of India's freedom struggle itself, a witness to the birth of this nation and of the idea that is India. To her, this idea was not a philosophical proposition laid down by her father, but a living experience as she traveled the length and breadth of this country, listening to the hearts of its men and women and giving them a voice. Some dismissed her as weak and incapable. Others called her a tyrant. But with the trust of her countrymen and women, painstakingly won, and with her dedication to their cause, she went on to serving her people, sacrificing her very life. It was, above all, this sense of duty that guided Indira Gandhi in her mission. She sought neither personal glory nor wealth, Every one ounce of her energy was channeled in the service of the nation. When Indira Gandhi spoke, she spoke for all Indians, men and women of all religions, regions, and backgrounds. No language was a barrier. She celebrated our magnificent diversity, battling those forces that foster division and strife among our people. She had a vision for India in the world of the 21st century, but it was not a soulless vision that came at the cost of our pluralist diversity. She saw an India that would not follow blindly the path led by the West. She saw it crafting its own future guided by its democratic and cultural ideals. When others failed, she wanted India to show the world the way. This, of course, made her mission doubly challenging, but Indira Gandhi was not a woman daunted by challenge. On the eve of her martyrdom, she declared, and I quote, every drop of my blood will invigorate the nation. And indeed, it did. Her sacrifice in preserving a united, diverse, egalitarian India will be remembered all the more so at a time when in the quest for shortcuts to greatness, we find leaders willing to undermine the very foundation of our national character. Few human beings enjoy the privilege of shaping the history and altering the geopolitics of a subcontinent. Indira Gandhi did so. Few have been called upon to make the supreme sacrifice 
in the cause for which they have lived. Indira Gandhi did so. Today, we remember her life as one of leadership, courage, and sacrifice. And on this auspicious occasion, I bow my head in her memory. I finally thank, I take this opportunity to thank uh, Rashtrapatiji for having accepted our invitation to deliver this lecture. Thank you. Srimati Sonia Gandhi, President Indian National Congress, Dr. Manmohan Singh, former Prime Minister, Sri Gulam Nabi Ajad, Leader of Opposition in Lad Sabha, Sri Rahul Gandhi, Vice President, Indian National Congress, Anand Sarma, MP Lad Sabha, and Convener, Implementation Committee of Indira Gandhi Centenary Celebration, Srimati Sheila Dixit, Sri Mukul Vashnik, Monishankaraya, distinguished members of the Congress Working Committee, senior leaders of the country, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. At the very outset, I tender my apology to all of you for my broken voice. It is because of the fact that I was little careless to cover myself in the morning walk and as a result of which, I have caught this very bad cold. And despite the fact that I knew I am to deliver the memorial lecture, I could not improve it much. I am deeply honored and considered myself to be privileged to be invited by the Congress President and the Implementation Committee to deliver the Indira Gandhi Centenary Lecture, which we are starting from today, our 99th, 100th birthday. And I understand throughout the year, through various events, the celebration will be observed. She was a remarkable personality of the 20th century, serving Prime Minister of India around 16 years. Indiraji was a key architect of modern India. She played a major role in shaping our country's role and destiny during a very critical period in history. She was unflinching in her concern for the poor and the disadvantaged. And she championed their cause with rare intensity. She was a crusader. Still her words ring in the ears of many of us who had the privilege of listening to her in 1983 from the same podium while delivering her concluding speech as the chairperson of the 7th Non-Aligned Summit that we cannot rest at peace unless we create a totally free from poverty backwardness, a world of peace with complete disarmament. The non-aligned movement cannot rest at peace. To the last breath of her life, she not only believed in that, but she carried it forward. I had the privilege of working with her at a very early age, in 1980, 
in early 70s, rather late 60s, and till her last breath. In fact, it is she who made me out of nothing. There is much that has been spoken and written about Srimati Indira Gandhi over the years. I remember in 1986, once Sardar Prasadji observed, who knew Indira Ji so closely, that largest number of books till then has been written on an individual politician and more so that of a developing country. Therefore, I would not like to venture to repeat what has been done by many eminent scholars, writers, commentators, editors of newspapers. I would like to focus on describing how her entire life was a saga of courage and conviction. In a letter written to her 86 years ago, on October 26, 1930, by her father, Pundit Jharlal Nehru, from Central Prison of Naini, I am just like to quote, I am not reading the entire quotation, and for the information of the distinguished audience, I say that almost 600 copies, or more than that, both in Hindi and English have been given to the organizers, and some copies are available which will be given to the media and the website after my observations. I am quoting only a few words from that letter. I quote, one little test I shall ask you to apply whenever you are in doubt. Never do anything in secret or anything that you would wish to hide. For the desire to hide anything means that you are afraid and fear is bad thing and unworthy of you. Be brave and all the rest follows. She took this advice to her heart. She remained brave. She faced all the challenges bravely. And she faced the last assault on her with brave courage and confidence. What she learned at the tender age of 13, October 1930, she was just 13 years old. But this had the permanent imprint in her. I am just <coughs> mentioning a small incident which happened in 1946. In the days of the communal frenzy, she was in Delhi. While coming, she found that there was a crowd about 200 persons attacking an old man in the age group of 60 to 70. She came out from the running car and put that man behind her. Then the crowd asked her, who are you, what are you doing? She told them very bravely, it's Im <coughs> not important, what's my name? I know what I am doing. I am protecting the old man. What are you doing? They said, we are going to kill you. If you don't, allow us to kill him. They said, if you have the courage, do so. And out of 200, around 200 people, nobody had the courage to raise their little finger. I 
as a consequence of this event bapuji entrusted her in those days to work alone in the muslim mahallas of delhi speaking much later on communalism she observed it is something within us some lack within us that makes us give in violence on every little provocation this is not a strength sign of strength or courage but a very great weakness and cowardice what can be more cowardice than a group of people wanting to kill or hurt an individual indira ji despised the cowardice of perpetrators of the communal violence and fought against it relentlessly during her life she rose above all divisions of religion caste community and creed there were many who advised her in the days of a very dark chapter of indian history when blue star operation took place i remember not in high rhetoric but in somber voice she ne told that i know the consequences but what will have to be done will have to be done and it will be done indira gandhi first time became the congress president in the nagpur session of course prior to that she was elected to the working committee and central election committee at the age of 42 years like moulan azad subhash bose and pandit jawaharlal nehru she became the congress president president of the premier organization of this country and one of the oldest organization political body in the world at the age of 40 she showed her determination and courage it was not hunger for power but when it was challenge to her that whether she can face the contest in the leadership of the congress parliamentary party after the death of shastri ji remember the members of the parliament were elected in 1962 it was in january 1966 she had no major role in selecting the candidates or in 62 she was not the star campaigner of the congress party it was pandit jawaharlal nehru who was the star campaigner of the last general election and in every general election even before that from 1937 election 1946 election and 52 election onwards it was nehru was the star campaigner of congress but when it was a question of challenge a very senior leader challenged her she accepted the challenge and won by a convincing majority out of 526 votes polled by the members of parliament to elect their leaders congress members she secured 355 for the convenience of the audience and those who are interested to go to the details in my printed speech i have quoted the source of every quotation and fact which i have used in this lecture and from the footnote they will get the sources and they can go for details from those sources 
what happened later on is the history of the history of this country mixed with the history of the international congress and also her life from 67 onwards he had to face the general election and for the first time country was particularly congress party was facing the fourth lok sabha elections without the face of jawahar lal nehru consequence was not very welcome by one stroke 70 seats in lok sabha were reduced from 352 it came down to 282 a large number of states bihar odisha west bengal tamil nadu kerala congress lost failed to gain majority in the assembly two other states very soon congress gov non congress government was replaced by non congress governments through the process of defection in up and madhya pradesh and that caused an uncertainty and instability to some extent in the indian political structure and system and here there are many eminent lawyers and constitutional experts i would request them to study one particular thing because as a student of history i find it very curious that after delivering justice judgment in the case of goloknath case chief justice of supreme court of india did then chief justice subbarao and it is known to everybody that this judgment was delivered as a majority judgment by the chief justice and difference was one vote and it was in the full bench of the supreme court and where it was for the first time from 1950 to 1967 after 17 years it was pointed out parliament has no constituent power and it has no authority to amend the fundamental rights up to this much i can understand that it is the judicial exercise of the supreme court and highest court of the country who has been entrusted with the responsibilities of interpreting the constitution but later on surprises me what happened immediately after resignation within weeks chief justice of india offered himself to be a candidate in the presidential election of 1967 editor chief justice and he was backed immediately by a large number of political parties who were opposed to indian national congress and it is surprising if you go through the voting pattern of the presidential elections from first election to the election of the 13th president always the margin had been huge except only in one case in 1969 between sanjeev reddy and vivi giri and in this election between justice subbarao and dr jakir hosen dr jakir hosen won by a margin of 1,7273 votes he got 4,71244 and dr subbarao got 3,63000 971 this is one question which i am posing before the jurists and constitutional experts in the country because after that we found series of events where judiciary came to confrontation between first between legislature and judiciary and thereafter between judiciary and the executive 
the second issue which is very interesting how congress parliamentary board again in its bangalore session by a majority of vote by 4 to 2 selected sanjeev reddy as the successor after jakir hosen's death as a congress candidate to face the to be the presidential candidate he was just at the age of 54 an eminent political personality of this country who became president of indian national congress chief minister twice at a very tender age he became the minister of undivided madras thereafter twice chief ministers of andhra pradesh union minister speaker of lok sabha at the age of 54 offered himself to be a candidate for the presidential election was there an attempt to change the political structure and make the presidential office as the some sort of executive office otherwise why a young man relatively young man when i became president i was more than 75 years old and most of the presidents were at least above 65 why i am saying it subsequent to that when the amendment to article 74 these words were added that the president in his exercise will be obliged to act as per the advice of the council of ministers which were added as a part of the 42nd amendment in 1976 and surprisingly this part was not changed of course when the 44th amendment was brought to rectify many of the amendments introduced in 42nd amendments this is a serious legal questions and i think future historians constitutional experts would do well to deliberate on these issues because this was the part of the game plan and as a consequences of that many a general elections in this country has been fought but if you look at in 1971 general elections a major part of the campaign was as incumbent prime minister and congress leader mrs indira gandhi did not want only majority she wanted to have a special majority to amend the constitution she got the special majority in 71 elections in lok sabha it got reflected in rajya sabha also and in the 24th amendment of the constitution a major change was introduced in article 368 of the constitution by inserting the constituent power of the parliament and today it is interpreted that the parliament has the constituent power and it has not seized its constituent power with the cessation of constituent assembly and the exercise of the constituent power parliament can make law including many of the parts which were nullified by the golognath judgment however supreme court did not remain at peace through keshavananda bharati case they again reinterpreted and observed that there are certain basic structures which parliament cannot change and there is no exhaustive list available what are the basic structures and what are not basic structures of the constitution that's why i am urging the eminent constitutional lawyers and experts to deliver on this subject and to 
have a national debate so that we can have some clarity of the situation in respect of this. Another important aspect where also the inherent trend of Mrs. Indira Gandhi, that is her courage and conviction, was reflected in the creation of Bangladesh. And supporting the liberation movement of Bangladesh. If you have noticed her observations in various international fora, she moved almost the whole world, almost whole world. She sent as her emissaries eminent persons including Jayaprakash Nara. Her whole object was not to interfere or inter uh, in, intervene in the internal matter of Pakistan. When this was alleged time and again by Pakistan and their mentor, United States, she said, no, I have no intention of interfering with the internal affairs of Pakistan. I am concerned only with my countries. And she raised a very vital question in her address to the General Assembly of the United Nations in 1971 in the month of September, which was later on decided on 8th of December in 1971 in the United Nations Security Council. And Soviet Russia strongly supported and put its veto on the very fundamental issue which she raised that I would like to know from this august assembly and international body, what is the definition of aggression? Right now, international United Nations organization are having 180 member nations. Of these 180, I am talking of 1971, of these 180 nation states, there are as many as 80 states whose combined population is less than 10 million. Combined population. And entire population of these countries are thrust on one country by the internal policy of a neighboring country. If this is not aggression, I would like to know what is the definition of aggression. And when the Security Council, of course you know United Nations overwhelmingly supported the political solution to resolve the crisis of Bangladesh. But when the issue came to be clinched in the Security Council on 8th of December, Security Council, particularly the Soviet Russia put its veto defending this definition of the aggression and saying that it cannot be done, that combined population of 80 nation states, member nation states, could be thrust in one country by the internal policy of another country is not simply acceptable. This I am referring to. She knew the consequences. It was not that she did not know. She knew the economic impact of it. She knew that if there be drought, and unfortunately it happened like that consecutively, three years drought affected the Indian economy seriously. She knew the implication of the international oil crisis which was impending then, and the first oil crisis came immediately after that. But nothing deterred her. She decided to pursue her goal and she ultimately achieved the objective as a result of which Bangladesh became a reality and a new nation 
was born. There are many literatures after her defeat in 1977 and it is attributed to the emergency. Even recently I have been criticized by some eminent columnists because in my second volume I have not written and I have been accused that as an author I have not been true and honest to my observations. And I candidly admit what I wrote in my memoirs that I don't want to discuss in details because volumes have been written on it and from various sides. I would not like to add anything. And many things could be added from hindsight because after all we acquire wisdom when the events happen after that. But I don't want to have that type of judgment in my observations. That's why I have avoided. But the fact remains that she did not pass on the bark to anybody. In her first statement in the Congress Working Committee, she said, 11 years the party gave me the responsibility to lead it. People of this country supported my party, kept us in power for 20 years after independence. I humbly accept the verdict of the people and I will not like to make anybody responsible. I am responsible. But she also did not subscribe to the view which a section of the Congress leaders at that point of time took, that we shall have to make the constructive cooperation in the opposition. She said opposition has a role. That role is to oppose, to expose, and to depose if possible. As opposition party, if we go on in every stage to be apologetic what has happened in the past, I am afraid we will not be able to kindle, inspire in the mind of the people, particularly the congressmen and women, the Dalits, minorities, who are suffering at the various ends of the policies of new dispensation. And history has proved who was correct. I remember one of the very critical writer and author of Mrs. Indira Gandhi. How graphically he projected her Belchi travel on an <laughs> elephant back. And she said, thank God that there is no journalists or cameraman. So I can say only, hail to Indira Gandhi, three cheers for her. But later on, <laughs> it was revealed, and he himself wrote in his book, that I do not imagine of any Indian politician of that stature, wading miles to reach a Dalit village, where some Dalit people have been brutally killed. And not one event, events after events. It proved that she did not compromise with her ideological positions whenever she found it necessary to fight it out. I would not like to lengthen my observations I am afraid I have taken a little longer time than that, but I must end my observations 
which are oft quoted and famous speech in Odisha. And before that, what she said on the day of her expulsion and when parliament passed a judgment to send her, Mr. Dhawan is present here, he was also sent to prison on that occasion for the alleged breach of privilege of the house of people. But her speech was memorable. What she said on December 13, 1978, I quote a few lines. I am a small person, but I have stood for certain values and objectives. Every insult heard at me will rebound. Every punishment inflicted on me will be a source of strength to me. She goes on. And finally she says, the atmosphere of this house, Lok Shobha, has been reminiscence of the scene in Alice in Wonderland, when all the cards rise up in the air and shout, off with her head. Honorable members, my head is yours. She concluded in that way. It is known to all of you what happened after that. And when she entered into parliament in 1980, how gloriously she entered. I was mentioning about her last speech in Odisha. This is oft quoted. Many of these words are remembered to heart by the people, but still I think it speaks in short the entire persona of Indira Gandhi. I do not care whether I live or not. I have lived a long life and if I am proud of anything, it is that I spend the whole of my life in service. I am proud only of this and nothing else. And as long as there is breath in me, so long will I continue to serve. And when my life goes, I can say that every drop of blood that is in me will give life to India and strengthen it. A note was found among her papers after her death in which she noted in her own handwriting, if I die a violent death, as some fear and a few are plotting, I know the violence will be in the thought and the action of the assassin, not in my doing. For no hate is dark enough to overshadow the extent of my love for my people and my country. No force is strong enough to divert me from my purpose and my endeavor to take this country forward. I cannot understand how anyone can be an Indian and not be proud the richness and infinite variety of our composite heritage, magnificence of the people's spirit, equal to any disaster or burden, form in their faith, gay spontaneously, even in the poverty and hardship. I do believe, ladies and gentlemen, to pay best tribute to the memory of the great daughter of India, to be proud of an in Indian, to feel proud, to have pride 
in this proud nation that would be the best tribute to our thank you ladies and gentlemen i once again sincerely express my gratitude to the organizations of this centenary celebration committee for inviting me to share some of my thoughts about this great personality of this century thank you on behalf of the chairman of the committee that has been established to celebrate the centenary of shrimati indira gandhi her close associate shri r k dhawan and on behalf of the other members of the committee i am honored to propose this vote of thanks first to the honorable congress president who has explained to us the message of indira ji which was fundamentally that she wanted india to show the world the way these are words that are going to reverberate in our minds over the next 365 days also most importantly i am here to express the gratitude of every one of us here for the formidable address we have just heard from the honorable president of india rashtrapati ji the voice that we heard from rashtrapati bhavan and through vigyan bhavan today was that of a young man who was chosen personally by indira ji to be one of her closest advisors at a very very young age and therefore what we heard from him was the voice of a lived experience and that lived experience was reflected in so many of the sentences that he placed before us that i find it difficult to choose which ones to recall but i think i would like to begin by referring to that letter which pandit jawaharlal nehru wrote to the 13 year old indira gandhi in which he gave her the injunction be brave and it was that courage that she displayed all through her life Sri Pranab Mukherjee has taken us on a walk through the corridors of history. He has spoken to us given the limitations of his constitutional office in a manner that has been frank, fair and fearless. He has spoken both as a statesman and as a constitutional expert but perhaps above all as he himself said as a historian and from that he has set the tone for what he hopes and expects will be a national debate on indira gandhi right through her centenary year and at the end of that debate i am sure we will come to a national consensus that here was a lady who was totally democratic always a patriot and always a leader totally dedicated to the nation and her people as evidenced by the belchi incident to which president mukherjee referred and almost the last lines she left for all of us in papers that were discovered after her death and which the honorable president has quoted to you i cannot understand how one can be an indian and not be proud that is what has made our country made our people and certainly made my generation for we grew up under the shadow of indira gandhi and under her leadership she was unflinching as the president said in her commitment to the poor and she championed their cause and therefore i take the liberty of ending this vote of thanks 
with words associated with Indiraji, which will be heard through the corridors of history and into the future generations. Wo kehte hai, Indira hatao. Hum kehte hai, gharibi hatao. Thank you, Jai Hind.